Experience by Ralph Waldo Emerson If you are returning to the Classic Masterworks channel, welcome back. If you are new, please don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you will be made aware of our latest content. And now, on with the story. Where do we find ourselves? In a series of which we do not know the extremes and believe that it has none. We wake and find ourselves on a stair. There are stairs below us, which we seem to have ascended. There are stairs above us, many a one, which go upward and out of sight. But the genius which according to the old belief stands at the door by which we enter and gives us the lethe to drink that we may tell no tales, mix the cup too strongly, and we cannot shake off the lethargy now at noonday. Sleep lingers all our lifetime about our eyes as night hovers all day in the boughs of the fir tree. All things swim and glitter. Our life is not so much threatened as our perception. Ghost-like we glide through nature and should not know our place again. Did our birth fall in some fit of indigence and frugality in nature that she was so sparing of her fire and so liberal of her earth that it appears to us that we lack the affirmative principle and though we have health and reason, yet we have no superfluity of spirit for new creation? We have enough to live and bring the year about, but not an ounce to impart or to invest. Ah, that our genius were a little more of a genius. We are like millers on the lower levels of a stream when the factories above them have exhausted the water. We too fancy that the upper people must have raised their dams. If any of us knew what we were doing or where we are going, then when we think we best know. We do not know today whether we are busy or idle. In times when we thought ourselves indolent, we have afterwards discovered that much was accomplished and much was begun in us. All our days are so unprofitable while they pass, that tis wonderful where or when we ever got anything of this which we call wisdom, poetry, virtue. We never got it on any dated calendar day. Some heavenly days must have been intercalated somewhere, like those that Hermes won with dice of the moon, that Osiris might be born. It is said all martyrdoms look mean when they were suffered. Every ship is a romantic object, except that we sail in embark and the romance quits our vessel and hangs on every other sail in the horizon our life looks trivial and we shun to record it men seem to have learned of the horizon the art of perpetual retreating and reference yonder uplands are rich pasturage and my neighbor has fertile meadow but my field says the querulous farmer only holds the world together i quote another man saying unluckily that other withdraws himself in the same way and quotes me Tis the trick of nature thus to degrade today, a good deal of buzz, and somewhere a result slipped magically in. Every roof is agreeable to the eye until it is lifted, then we find tragedy and moaning women and hard-eyed husbands and deluges of lethe, and the men ask, what's the news, as if the old were so bad? How many individuals can we count in society? How many actions? How many opinions? So much of our time is preparation, so much is routine, and so much retrospect, that the pith of each man's genius contracts itself to a very few hours. The history of literature, take the net result of Tiraboski, Wharton, or Schlegel, is the sum of very few ideas and of very few original tales, all the rest being variation of these. So in this great society wide lying around us, a critical analysis would find very few spontaneous actions. It is almost all custom and gross sense. There are even few opinions, and these seem organic in the speakers, and do not disturb the universal necessity. What opium is instilled into all disaster? It shows formidable as we approach it, but there is at last no rough rasping friction, but the most slippery sliding surfaces. We fall soft on a thought, 8DEA is gentle. Over men's heads walking aloft, with tender feet treading so soft, People grieve and bemoan themselves, but it is not half so bad with them as they say. There are moods in which we court suffering, in the hope that here at least we shall find reality, sharp peaks and edges of truth. But it turns out to be seen painting and counterfeit. The only thing grief has taught me is to know how shallow it is. That, like all the rest, plays about the surface and never introduces me into the reality for contact with which we would even pay the costly price of sons and lovers. 
Was it Boscovich who found out that bodies never come in contact? Well, souls never touch their objects. An innavigable sea washes with silent waves between us and the things we aim at and converse with. Grief too will make us idealists. In the death of my son, now more than two years ago, I seem to have lost a beautiful estate, no more. I cannot get it nearer to me. If tomorrow I should be informed of the bankruptcy of my principal debtors, the loss of my property would be a great inconvenience to me, perhaps, for many years, but it would leave me as it found me, neither better nor worse. So is it with this calamity, it does not touch me, something which I fancied was a part of me, which could not be torn away without tearing me nor enlarged without enriching me, falls off from me and leaves no scar. It was Caducus. I grieve that grief can teach me nothing, nor carry me one step into real nature. The Indian who was laid under a curse that the wind should not blow on him, nor water flow to him, nor fire burn him, is a type of us all. The dearest events are summer rain, and we the prior coats that shed every drop. Nothing is left us now but death. We look to that with a grim satisfaction, saying there at least is reality that will not dodge us. I take this evanescence and lubricity of all objects, which lets them slip through our fingers then when we clutch hardest, to be the most unhandsome part of our condition. Nature does not like to be observed, and likes that we should be her fools and playmates. We may have the sphere for our cricket ball, but not a berry for our philosophy. Direct strokes she never gave us power to make, all our blows glance, all our hits are accidents. Our relations to each other are oblique and casual. Dream delivers us to dream, and there is no end to illusion. Life is a train of moods like a string of beads, and as we pass through them they prove to be many colored lenses which paint the world their own hue, and each shows only what lies in its focus. From the mountain you see the mountain. We animate what we can, and we see only what we animate. Nature and books belong to the eyes that see them. It depends on the mood of the man whether he shall see the sunset or the fine poem. There are always sunsets, and there is always genius, but only a few hours so serene that we can relish nature or criticism. The more or less depends on structure or temperament. Temperament is the iron wire on which the beads are strung. Of what use is fortune or talent to a cold and defective nature? Who cares what sensibility or discrimination a man has at some time shown if he falls asleep in his chair? Or if he laugh and giggle? Or if he apologize? Or is infected with egotism? Or thinks of his dollar? Or cannot go buy food? Or has gotten a child in his boyhood? Of what use is genius if the organ is too convex or too concave and cannot find a focal distance within the actual horizon of human life? Of what use if the brain is too cold or too hot and the man does not care enough for results to stimulate him to experiment and hold him up in it? Or if the web is too finely woven, too irritable by pleasure and pain, so that life stagnates from too much reception without due outlet? Of what use to make heroic vows of amendment if the same old lawbreaker is to keep them? What cheer can the religious sentiment yield when that is suspected to be secretly dependent on the seasons of the year and the state of the blood? I knew a witty physician who found the creed in the biliary duct and used to affirm that if there was disease in the liver, the man became a Calvinist, and if that organ was sound, he became a Unitarian. Very mortifying is the reluctant experience that some unfriendly excess or imbecility neutralizes the promise of genius. We see young men who owe us a new world, so readily and lavishly they promise, but they never acquit the debt, they die young and dodge the account, or if they live they lose themselves in the crowd. Temperament also enters fully into the system of illusions and shuts us in a prison of glass which we cannot see. There is an optical illusion about every person we meet. In truth they are all creatures of given temperament, which will appear in a given character, whose boundaries they will never pass, but we look at them, they seem alive, and we presume there is impulse in them. In the moment it seems impulse, in the year, in the lifetime, it turns out to be a certain uniform tune which the revolving barrel of the music box must play. Men resist the conclusion in the morning, but adopt it as the evening wears on, that temper prevails over everything of time, place, and condition, and is inconsumable in the flames of religion. 
Some modifications the moral sentiment avails to impose, but the individual texture holds its dominion, if not to bias the moral judgments, yet to fix the measure of activity and of enjoyment. I thus express the law as it is read from the platform of ordinary life, but must not leave it without noticing the capital exception. For temperament is a power which no man willingly hears any one praise but himself. On the platform of physics, we cannot resist the contracting influences of so-called science. Temperament puts all divinity to rout. I know the mental proclivity of physicians. I hear the chuckle of the phrenologists. Theoretic kidnappers and slave drivers, they esteem each man the victim of another, who winds him round his finger by knowing the law of his being, and by such cheap signboards as the color of his beard or the slope of his occiput, reads the inventory of his fortunes and character. The grossest ignorance does not disgust like this impudent knowingness. The physicians say they are not materialists, but they are. Spirit is matter reduced to an extreme thinness, oh so thin, but the definition of spiritual should be that which is its own evidence. What notions do they attach to love? What to religion? One would not willingly pronounce these words in their hearing and give them the occasion to profane them. I saw a gracious gentleman who adapts his conversation to the form of the head of the man he talks with. I had fancied that the value of life lay in its inscrutable possibilities and the fact that I never know in addressing myself to a new individual, what may befall me. I carry the keys of my castle in my hand, ready to throw them at the feet of my lord, whenever and in what disguise soever he shall appear. I know he is in the neighborhood hidden among vagabonds. Shall I preclude my future by taking a high seat and kindly adapting my conversation to the shape of heads? When I come to that, the doctors shall buy me for a cent, but, sir, medical history, the report to the institute, the proven facts. I distrust the facts and the inferences. Temperament is the veto or limitation power in the Constitution, very justly applied to restrain an opposite excess in the Constitution, but absurdly offered as a bar to original equity. When virtue is in presence, all subordinate powers sleep. On its own level, or in view of nature, temperament is final. I see not. If one be once caught in this trap of so-called sciences, any escape for the man from the links of the chain of physical necessity. Given such an embryo, such a history must follow. On this platform one lives in a sty of sensualism and would soon come to suicide. But it is impossible that the creative power should exclude itself. And to every intelligence there is a door which is never closed through which the creator passes. The intellect, seeker of absolute truth, or the heart, lover of absolute good, intervenes for our succor, and at one whisper of these high powers we awake from ineffectual struggles with this nightmare. We hurl it into its own hell, and cannot again contract ourselves to so base a state. The secret of the illusoriness is in the necessity of a succession of moods or objects. Gladly we would anchor, but the anchorage is quicksand. This onward trick of nature is too strong for us, Pero as I move. When at night I look at the moon and stars, I seem stationary and they to hurry. Our love of the real draws us to permanence, but health of body consists in circulation and sanity of mind in variety or facility of association. We need change of objects. Dedication to one thought is quickly odious. We house with the insane and must humor them, then conversation dies out. Once I took such delight in Montaigne that I thought I should not need any other book, before that, in Shakespeare, then in Plutarch, then in Plotinus, at one time in Bacon, afterwards in Goethe, even in Bettine, but now I turn the pages of either of them languidly, whilst I still cherish their genius. So with pictures, each will bear an emphasis of attention once, which it cannot retain, though we fain would continue to be pleased in that manner. How strongly I have felt of pictures that when you have seen one well, you must take your leave of it, you shall never see it again. I have had good lessons from pictures which I have since seen without emotion or remark. A deduction must be made from the opinion which even the wise express of a new book or occurrence. Their opinion gives me tidings of their mood and some vague guess at the new fact, but is no wise to be trusted as the lasting relation between that intellect and that thing. The child asks, Mama, why don't I like the story as well as when you told it me yesterday? Alas, 
Child, it is even so with the oldest cherubim of knowledge. But will it answer that question to say, because thou wert born to a whole and this story is a particular? The reason of the pain this discovery causes us, and we make it late in respect to works of art and intellect, is the plaint of tragedy which murmurs from it in regard to persons, to friendship and love. That immobility and absence of elasticity which we find in the arts, we find with more pain in the artist. There is no power of expansion in men. Our friends early appear to us as representatives of certain ideas which they never pass or exceed. They stand on the brink of the ocean of thought and power, but they never take the single step that would bring them there. A man is like a bit of Labrador spar, which has no luster as you turn it in your hand until you come to a particular angle, then it shows deep and beautiful colors. There is no adaptation or universal applicability in men, but each has his special talent, and the mastery of successful men consists in adroitly keeping themselves where and when that turn shall be oftenest to be practiced. We do what we must, and call it by the best names we can, and would fain have the praise of having intended the result which ensues. I cannot recall any form of man who is not superfluous sometimes. But is not this pitiful? Life is not worth the taking, to do tricks in. Of course it needs the whole society to give the symmetry we seek. The party colored will must revolve very fast to appear white. Something is earned too by conversing with so much folly and defect. And fine, whoever loses, we are always of the gaining party. Divinity is behind our failures and follies also. The plays of children are nonsense, but very educative nonsense. So it is with the largest and solemnest things, with commerce, government, church, marriage, and so with the history of every man's bread and the ways by which he is to come by it. Like a bird which alights nowhere, but hops perpetually from bow to bow, is the power which abides in no man and in no woman, but for a moment speaks from this one, and for another moment from that one. But what help from these fineries or pedantries? What help from thought? Life is not dialectics. We, I think, in these times, have had lessons enough of the futility of criticism. Our young people have thought and written much on labor and reform, and for all that they have written, neither the world nor themselves have got on a step. Intellectual tasting of life will not supersede muscular activity. If a man should consider the nicety of the passage of a piece of bread down his throat, he would starve. At Education Farm, the noblest theory of life sat on the noblest figures of young men and maidens, quite powerless and melancholy. It would not rake or pitch a ton of hay, it would not rub down a horse, and the men and maidens it left pale and hungry. A political orator wittily compared our party promises to western roads, which opened stately enough, with planted trees on either side to tempt the traveler, but soon became narrow and narrower and ended in a squirrel track and ran up a tree. So does culture with us, it ends in headache. Unspeakably sad and barren does life look to those who a few months ago were dazzled with the splendor of the promise of the times. There is now no longer any right course of action nor any self-devotion left among the Iranis. Objections and criticism we have had our fill of. There are objections to every course of life and action, and the practical wisdom infers an indifferency from the omnipresence of objection. The whole frame of things preaches indifferency. Do not craze yourself with thinking, but go about your business anywhere. Life is not intellectual or critical, but sturdy. Its chief good is for well-mixed people who can enjoy what they find, without question. Nature hates peeping, and our mothers speak her very sense when they say, Children, eat your victuals, and say no more of it. To fill the hour, that is happiness, to fill the hour and leave no crevice for a repentance or an approval. We live amid surfaces, and the true art of life is to skate well on them. Under the oldest, moldiest conventions, a man of native force prospers just as well as in the newest world, and that by skill of handling and treatment. He can take hold anywhere. Life itself is a mixture of power and form, and will not bear the least excess of either. To finish the moment, to find the journey's end in every step of the road, to live the greatest number of good hours, is wisdom. It is not the part of men, but of fanatics, or of mathematicians, if you will, to say that the shortness of life considered, it is not worth caring whether for so short a duration we were sprawling in want or sitting high. 
Since our office is with moments, let us husband them. Five minutes of today are worth as much to me as five minutes in the next millennium. Let us be poised and wise and our own today. Let us treat the men and women well, treat them as if they were real, perhaps they are. Men live in their fancy, like drunkards whose hands are too soft and tremulous for successful labor. It is a tempest of fancies, and the only ballast I know is a respect to the present hour. Without any shadow of doubt, amidst this vertigo of shows and politics, I settle myself ever the firmer in the creed that we should not postpone and refer and wish, but do broad justice where we are, by whomsoever we deal with, accepting our actual companions and circumstances, however humble or odious as the mystic officials to whom the universe has delegated its whole pleasure for us. If these are mean and malignant, their contentment, which is the last victory of justice, is a more satisfying echo to the heart than the voice of poets and the casual sympathy of admirable persons. I think that however a thoughtful man may suffer from the defects and absurdities of his company, he cannot without affectation deny to any set of men and women a sensibility to extraordinary merit. The coarse and frivolous have an instinct of superiority if they have not a sympathy and honor it in their blind capricious way with sincere homage. The fine young people despise life, but in me, and in such as with me are free from dyspepsia, and to whom a day is a sound and solid good, it is a great excess of politeness to look scornful and to cry for company. I am grown by sympathy the little eager and sentimental, but leave me alone and I should relish every hour and what it brought me, the potluck of the day, as heartily as the oldest gossip in the barroom. I am thankful for small mercies. I compared notes with one of my friends who expects everything of the universe and is disappointed when anything is less than the best, and I found that I begin at the other extreme, expecting nothing, and am always full of thanks for moderate goods. I accept the clangor and jangle of contrary tendencies. I find my account in sots and bores also. They give a reality to the circumjacent picture which such a vanishing meteorous appearance can ill spare. In the morning I awake and find the old world, wife, babes, and mother, Concord and Boston, the dear old spiritual world, and even the dear old devil not far off. If we will take the good we find, asking no questions, we shall have heaping measures. The great gifts are not got by analysis. Everything good is on the highway. The middle region of our being is the tempered zone. We may climb into the thin and cold realm of pure geometry and lifeless science or sink into that of sensation. Between these extremes is the equator of life, of thought, of spirit, of poetry, a narrow belt. Moreover, in popular experience everything good is on the highway. A collector peeps into all the picture shops of Europe for a landscape of Poussin, a crayon sketch of Salvatore, but the Transfiguration, the Last Judgment, the Communion of St. Jerome, and what are as transcended as these are on the walls of the Vatican, the Ophysiae, or the Louvre, where every footman may see them, to say nothing of nature's pictures in every street, of sunsets and sunrises every day, and the sculpture of the human body never absent. A collector recently bought at public auction in London for 157 guineas an autograph of Shakespeare, but for nothing a schoolboy can read Hamlet and can detect secrets of highest concernment yet unpublished therein. I think I will never read any but the commonest books, the Bible, Homer, Dante, Shakespeare, and Milton. Then we are impatient of so public a life and planet, and run hither and thither for nooks and secrets. The imagination delights in the woodcraft of Indians, trappers, and bee hunters. We fancy that we are strangers, and not so intimately domesticated in the planet as the wild man and the wild beast and bird. But the exclusion reaches them also, reaches the climbing, flying, gliding, feathered, and four-footed man. Fox and woodchuck, hawk and snipe and bittern, when nearly seen, have no more root in the deep world than man, and are just such superficial tenants of the globe. Then the new molecular philosophy shows astronomical interspaces betwixt atom and atom, shows that the world is all outside, it has no inside. The midworld is best. Nature, as we know her, is no saint. The lights of the church, the ascetics, gentoos, and corn eaters, she does not distinguish by any favor. She comes eating and drinking and sinning. Her darlings, the great, the strong, the beautiful, are not children of our law, 
do not come out of the Sunday school, nor weigh their food, nor punctually keep the commandments. If we will be strong with her strength, we must not harbor such disconsolate consciences, borrowed too from the consciences of other nations. We must set up the strong present tense against all the rumors of wrath, past or to come. So many things are unsettled which it is of the first importance to settle, and, pending their settlement, we will do as we do. Whilst the debate goes forward on the equity of commerce, and will not be closed for a century or two, new and old England may keep shop. Law of copyright and international copyright is to be discussed, and in the interim we will sell our books for the most we can. Expediency of literature, reason of literature, lawfulness of writing down a thought, is questioned, much is to say on both sides, and, while the fight waxes hot, thou, dearest scholar, stick to thy foolish task, add a line every hour, and between whiles add a line. Right to hold land, right of property, is disputed, and the conventions convene, and before the vote is taken, dig away in your garden, and spend your earnings as a waif or godsend to all serene and beautiful purposes. Life itself is a bubble and a skepticism, and a sleep within a sleep. Grant it, and as much more as they will, but thou, God's darling, heed thy private dream, thou wilt not be missed in the scorning and skepticism, there are enough of them, stay there in thy closet and toil until the rest are agreed what to do about it. Thy sickness, they say, and thy puny habit requires that thou do this or avoid that, but know that thy life is a flitting state, a tent for a night, and do thou, sick or well, finish that stint. Thou art sick, but shalt not be worse, and the universe, which holds thee dear, shall be the better. Human life is made up of the two elements, power and form, and the proportion must be invariably kept if we would have it sweet and sound. Each of these elements in excess makes a mischief as hurtful as its defect. Everything runs to excess, every good quality is noxious if unmixed, and, to carry the danger to the edge of ruin, nature causes each man's peculiarity to superbound. Here, among the farms, we adduce the scholars as examples of this treachery. They are nature's victims of expression. You who see the artist, the orator, the poet, too near, and find their life no more excellent than that of mechanics or farmers, and themselves victims of partiality, very hollow and haggard, and pronounce them failures, not heroes, but quacks, conclude very reasonably that these arts are not for man, but are disease. Yet nature will not bear you out. Irresistible nature made men such, and makes legions more of such, every day. You love the boy reading in a book, gazing at a drawing, or a cast, yet what are these millions who read and behold, but incipient writers and sculptors? Add a little more of that quality which now reads and sees, and they will seize the pen and chisel. And if one remembers how innocently he began to be an artist, he perceives that nature joined with his enemy. A man is a golden impossibility. The line he must walk is a hair's breadth. The wise through excess of wisdom is made a fool. How easily, if fate would suffer it, we might keep forever these beautiful limits, and adjust ourselves, once for all, to the perfect calculation of the kingdom of known cause and effect. In the street and in the newspapers, life appears so plain a business that manly resolution and adherence to the multiplication table through all weathers will ensure success. But ah, presently comes a day, or is it only a half hour, with its angel whispering, which discomfits the conclusions of nations and of years. Tomorrow again everything looks real and angular, the habitual standards are reinstated, common sense is as rare as genius, is the basis of genius, and experience is hands and feet to every enterprise, and yet, he who should do his business on this understanding would be quickly bankrupt. Power keeps quite another road than the turnpikes of choice and will, namely the subterranean and invisible tunnels and channels of life. It is ridiculous that we are diplomatists and doctors and considerate people. There are no dupes like these. Life is a series of surprises and would not be worth taking or keeping if it were not. God delights to isolate us every day and hide from us the past and the future. We would look about us, but with grand politeness he draws down before us an impenetrable screen of purest sky and another behind us of purest sky. You will not remember, he seems to say, and you will not expect. All good conversation, manners, and action 
come from a spontaneity which forgets usages and makes the moment great. Nature hates calculators. Her methods are saltatory and impulsive. Man lives by pulses. Our organic movements are such, and the chemical and ethereal agents are undulatory and alternate, and the mind goes antagonizing on and never prospers but by fits. We thrive by casualties. Our chief experiences have been casual. The most attractive class of people are those who are powerful obliquely and not by the direct stroke, men of genius, but not yet accredited. One gets the cheer of their light without paying too great a tax. Theirs is the beauty of the bird or the morning light, and not of art. In the thought of genius there is always a surprise, and the moral sentiment is well called the newness, for it is never other, as new to the oldest intelligence as to the young child, the kingdom that cometh without observation. In like manner, for practical success, there must not be too much design. A man will not be observed in doing that which he can do best. There is a certain magic about his properest action which stupefies your powers of observation, so that though it is done before you, you wist not of it. The art of life has a pudency and will not be exposed. Every man is an impossibility until he is born, everything impossible until we see a success. The ardors of piety agree at last with the coldest skepticism that nothing is of us or our works, that all is of God. Nature will not spare us the smallest leaf of laurel. All writing comes by the grace of God and all doing and having. I would gladly be moral and keep due meets and bounds, which I dearly love, and allow the most to the will of man, but I have set my heart on honesty in this chapter, and I can see nothing at last, and success or failure, than more or less of vital force supplied from the eternal. The results of life are uncalculated and uncalculable. The years teach much which the days never know. The persons who compose our company, converse, and come and go, and design and execute many things, and somewhat comes of it all, but an unlooked for result. The individual is always mistaken. He designed many things, and drew in other persons as coadjutors, quarreled with some or all, blundered much, and something is done, all are a little advanced, but the individual is always mistaken. It turns out somewhat new and very unlike what he promised himself. The ancients, struck with this irreducibleness of the elements of human life to calculation, exalted chance into a divinity, but that is to stay too long at the spark, which glitters truly at one point, but the universe is warm with the latency of the same fire. The miracle of life, which will not be expounded, but will remain a miracle, introduces a new element. In the growth of the embryo, Sir Everard Holm, I think, noticed that the evolution was not from one central point, but coactive from three or more points. Life has no memory. That which proceeds in succession might be remembered, but that which is coexistent or ejaculated from a deeper cause, as yet far from being conscious, knows not its own tendency. So is it with us, now skeptical or without unity, because immersed in forms and effects all seeming to be of equally yet hostile value, and now religious, whilst in the reception of spiritual law. Bear with these distractions, with this coetaneous growth of the parts, they will one day be members, and obey one will. On that one will, on that secret cause, they nail our attention and hope. Life is hereby melted into an expectation or a religion. Underneath the inharmonious and trivial particulars is a musical perfection, the ideal journeying always with us, the heaven without rent or seam. Do but observe the mode of our illumination. When I converse with a profound mind, or if at any time being alone I have good thoughts, I do not at once arrive at satisfactions, as when, being thirsty, I drink water, or go to the fire, being cold, no. But I am at first apprised of my vicinity to a new and excellent region of life. By persisting to read or to think, this region gives further sign of itself, as it were in flashes of light, and sudden discoveries of its profound beauty and repose, as if the clouds that covered it parted at intervals and showed the approaching traveler the inland mountains, with the tranquil eternal meadows spread at their base, whereon flocks graze and shepherds pipe and dance. But every insight from this realm of thought is felt as initial, and promises a sequel. I do not make it, I arrive there, and behold what was there already. I make. Oh no. 
I clap my hands in infantine joy and amazement before the first opening to me of this august magnificence, old with the love and homage of innumerable ages, young with the life of life, the sunbright mecca of the desert. And what a future it opens. I feel a new heart beating with the love of the new beauty. I am ready to die out of nature and be born again into this new yet unapproachable America I have found in the West. Since neither now nor yesterday began, these thoughts, which have been ever, nor yet can, a man be found who their first entrance knew. If I have described life as a flux of moods, I must now add that there is that in us which changes not and which ranks all sensations and states of mind. The consciousness in each man is a sliding scale, which identifies him now with the first cause, and now with the flesh of his body, life above life, in infinite degrees. The sentiment from which it sprung determines the dignity of any deed, and the question ever is, not what you have done or forborne, but at whose command you have done or forborne it. Fortune, Minerva, Muse, Holy Ghost, these are quaint names, too narrow to cover this unbounded substance. The baffled intellect must still kneel before this cause, which refuses to be named ineffable cause, which every fine genius has essayed to represent by some emphatic symbol, as Thales by water, Anaximenes by air, Anaxagoras by noose, thought, Zoroaster by fire, Jesus and the moderns by love, and the metaphor of each has become a national religion. The Chinese Mencius has not been the least successful in his generalization. I fully understand language, he said, and nourish well my vast flowing vigor. I beg to ask what you call vast flowing vigor, said his companion. The explanation, replied Mencius, is difficult. This vigor is supremely great and in the highest degree unbending. Nourish it correctly and do it no injury, and it will fill up the vacancy between heaven and earth. This vigor accords with and assists justice and reason and leaves no hunger. In our more correct writing we give to this generalization the name of being and thereby confess that we have arrived as far as we can go suffice it for the joy of the universe that we have not arrived at a wall but at interminable oceans our life seems not present so much as perspective not for the affairs on which it is wasted but as a hint of this vast flowing vigor most of life seems to be mere advertisement of faculty. Information is given us not to sell ourselves cheap, that we are very great. So, in particulars, our greatness is always in a tendency or direction, not in an action. It is for us to believe in the rule, not in the exception. The noble are thus known from the ignoble. So in accepting the leading of the sentiments, it is not what we believe concerning the immortality of the soul or the like, but the universal impulse to believe that is the material circumstance and is the principal fact in the history of the globe. Shall we describe this cause as that which works directly? The spirit is not helpless or needful of mediate organs. It has plentiful powers and direct effects. I am explained without explaining, I am felt without acting, and where I am not. Therefore all just persons are satisfied with their own praise. They refuse to explain themselves and are content that new actions should do them that office. They believe that we communicate without speech and above speech and that no right action of ours is quite unaffecting to our friends at whatever distance for the influence of action is not to be measured by miles. Why should I fret myself because a circumstance has occurred which hinders my presence where I was expected? If I am not at the meeting, my presence where I am should be as useful to the commonwealth of friendship and wisdom as would be my presence in that place. I exert the same quality of power in all places. Thus journeys the mighty ideal before us, it never was known to fall into the rear. No man ever came to an experience which was satiating, but as good as tidings of a better. Onward and onward. In liberated moments we know that a new picture of life and duty is already possible the elements already exist in many minds around you of a doctrine of life which shall transcend any written record we have the new statement will comprise the skepticisms as well as the faiths of society and out of unbeliefs a creed shall be formed for skepticisms are not gratuitous or lawless but are limitations of the affirmative statement and the new philosophy must take them in and make affirmations outside of them just as much as it must include the oldest beliefs it is very unhappy but too late to be helped the discovery we have made that we exist 
That discovery is called the fall of man ever afterwards we suspect our instruments. We have learned that we do not see directly, but mediately, and that we have no means of correcting these colored and distorting lenses which we are, or of computing the amount of their errors. Perhaps these subject lenses have a creative power, perhaps there are no objects. Once we lived in what we saw, now, the rapaciousness of this new power, which threatens to absorb all things, engages us. Nature, art, persons, letters, religions, objects, successively tumble in, and God is but one of its ideas. Nature and literature are subjective phenomena, every evil and every good thing is a shadow which we cast. The street is full of humiliations to the proud. As the fop contrived to dress his bailiffs in his livery and make them wait on his guests at table, so the chagrins which the bad heart gives off as bubbles at once take form as ladies and gentlemen in the street, shopmen or barkeepers in hotels, and threaten or insult whatever is threatenable and insultable in us. Tis the same with our idolatries. People forget that it is the eye which makes the horizon, and the rounding mind's eye which makes this or that man a type or representative of humanity, with the name of hero or saint. Jesus, the providential man, is a good man on whom many people are agreed that these optical laws shall take effect. By love on one part and by forbearance to press objection on the other part, it is for a time settled that we will look at him in the center of the horizon and describe to him the properties that will attach to any man so seen. But the longest love or aversion has a speedy term. The great incressive self, rooted in absolute nature, supplants all relative existence and ruins the kingdom of mortal friendship and love. Marriage, in what is called the spiritual world, is impossible because of the inequality between every subject and every object. The subject is the receiver of Godhead, and at every comparison must feel his being enhanced by that cryptic might. Though not in energy, yet by presence, this magazine of substance cannot be otherwise than felt, nor can any force of intellect attribute to the object the proper deity which sleeps or wakes forever in every subject. Never can love make consciousness and description equal in force. There will be the same gulf between every me and thee as between the original and the picture. The universe is the bride of the soul. All private sympathy is partial. Two human beings are like globes, which can touch only in a point, and whilst they remain in contact, all other points of each of the spheres, life will be imaged, but cannot be divided nor doubled. Any invasion of its unity would be chaos. The soul is not twin-born, but the only begotten, and though revealing itself as child in time, child in appearance, is of a fatal and universal power, admitting no co-life. Every day, every act betrays the ill-concealed deity. We believe in ourselves as we do not believe in others. We permit all things to ourselves, and that which we call sin in others is experiment for us. It is an instance of our faith in ourselves that men never speak of crime as lightly as they think, where every man thinks a latitude safe for himself which is no wise to be indulged to another. The act looks very differently on the inside and on the outside, in its quality and in its consequences. Murder in the murderer is no such ruinous thought as poets and romancers will have it. It does not unsettle him or fright him from his ordinary notice of trifles. It is an act quite easy to be contemplated, but in its sequel it turns out to be a horrible jangle and confounding of all relations. Especially the crimes that spring from love seem right and fair from the actor's point of view, but when acted are found destructive of society. No man at last believes that he can be lost, nor that the crime in him is as black as in the felon. Because the intellect qualifies in our own case the moral judgments. For there is no crime to the intellect. That is antinomian or hypernomian, and judges law as well as fact. It is worse than a crime, it is a blunder, said Napoleon, speaking the language of the intellect. To it, the world is a problem in mathematics or the science of quantity, and it leaves out praise and blame and all weak emotions. All stealing is comparative. If you come to absolutes, pray who does not steal. Saints are sad, because they behold sin, even when they speculate, from the point of view of the conscience, and not of the intellect, a confusion of thought. Sin, seen from the thought, is a diminution, or less, seen from the conscience or will, it is privity or bad. 
The intellect names it shade, absence of light, and no essence. The conscience must feel it as essence, essential evil. This it is not, it has an objective existence, but no subjective. Thus inevitably does the universe wear our color, and every object fall successively into the subject itself. The subject exists, the subject enlarges, all things sooner or later fall into place. As I am, so I see, use what language we will, we can never say anything but what we are. Hermes, Cadmus, Columbus, Newton, Bonaparte are the mind's ministers. Instead of feeling a poverty when we encounter a great man, let us treat the newcomer like a traveling geologist who passes through our estate and shows us good slate, or limestone, or anthracite in our brush pasture. The partial action of each strong mind in one direction is a telescope for the objects on which it is pointed. But every other part of knowledge is to be pushed to the same extravagance ere the soul attains her due sphericity. Do you see that kitten chasing so prettily her own tail? If you could look with her eyes you might see her surrounded with hundreds of figures performing complex dramas, with tragic and comic issues, long conversations, many characters, many ups and downs of fate, and meantime it is only puss and her tail. How long before our masquerade will end its noise of tambourines, laughter, and shouting, and we shall find it was a solitary performance? A subject and an object, it takes so much to make the galvanic circuit complete, but magnitude adds nothing. What imports it whether it is Kepler and the Sphere, Columbus and America, a reader and his book, or Puss with her tail? It is true that all the muses and love and religion hate these developments, and will find a way to punish the chemist who publishes in the parlor the secrets of the laboratory. And we cannot say too little of our constitutional necessity of seeing things under private aspects or saturated with our humors. And yet is the god the native of these bleak rocks? That need makes in morals the capital virtue of self-trust. We must hold hard to this poverty, however scandalous, and by more vigorous self-recoveries, after the sallies of action, possess our axis more firmly. The life of truth is cold and so far mournful, but it is not the slave of tears, contritions, and perturbations. It does not attempt another's work, nor adopt another's facts. It is a main lesson of wisdom to know your own from another's. I have learned that I cannot dispose of other people's facts, but I possess such a key to my own as persuades me, against all their denials, that they also have a key to theirs. A sympathetic person is placed in the dilemma of a swimmer among drowning men, who all catch at him, and if he gives so much as a leg or a finger they will drown him. They wish to be saved from the mischiefs of their vices, but not from their vices. Charity would be wasted on this poor waiting on the symptoms. A wise and hardy physician will say, come out of that, as the first condition of advice. In this our talking America we are ruined by our good nature and listening on all sides. This compliance takes away the power of being greatly useful. A man should not be able to look other than directly and forthright. A preoccupied attention is the only answer to the importunate frivolity of other people, an attention, and to an aim which makes their wants frivolous. This is a divine answer, and leaves no appeal and no hard thoughts. In Flaxman's drawing of the Eumenides of Aeschylus, Orestes supplicates Apollo, whilst the Furies sleep on the threshold. The face of the god expresses a shade of regret and compassion, but is calm with the conviction of the irreconcilableness of the two spheres. He is born into other politics, into the eternal and beautiful. The man at his feet asks for his interest in turmoils of the earth, into which his nature cannot enter. And the humanities there lying express pictorially this disparity. The god is surcharged with his divine destiny. Illusion, temperament, succession, surface, surprise, reality, subjectiveness, these are threads on the loom of time, these are the lords of life. I dare not assume to give their order, but I name them as I find them in my way. I know better than to claim any completeness for my picture. I am a fragment, and this is a fragment of me. I can very confidently announce one or another law, which throws itself into relief and form, but I am too young yet by some ages to compile a code. I gossip for my hour concerning the eternal politics. I have seen many fair pictures not in vain. A wonderful time I have lived in. I am not the novice I was fourteen, nor yet seven years ago. Let who will ask where is the fruit? 
I find a private fruit sufficient. This is a fruit that I should not ask for a rash effect from meditations, councils, and the hiving of truths. I should feel it pitiful to demand a result on this town and county, an overt effect on the instant month and year. The effect is deep and secular as the cause. It works on periods in which mortal lifetime is lost. All I know is reception, I am and I have, but I do not get, and when I have fancied I had gotten anything, I found I did not. I worship with wonder the great fortune. My reception has been so large that I am not annoyed by receiving this or that superabundantly. I say to the genius, if you will pardon the proverb, in four mil, in four million. When I receive a new gift, I do not macerate my body to make the account square, for if I should die I could not make the account square. The benefit overran the merit the first day, and has overrun the merit ever since. The merit itself, so-called, I reckon part of the receiving. Also, that hankering after an overt or practical effect seems to me an apostasy. In good earnest, I am willing to spare this most unnecessary deal of doing. Life wears to me a visionary face. Hardest, roughest action is visionary also. It is but a choice between soft and turbulent dreams. People disparage knowing and the intellectual life and urge doing. I am very content with knowing, if only I could know. That is an august entertainment and would suffice me a great while. To know a little would be worth the expense of this world. I hear always the law of Adrastia that every soul which had acquired any truth should be safe from harm until another period. I know that the world I converse with in the city and in the farms is not the world I think. I observe that difference and shall observe it. One day I shall know the value and law of this discrepance. But I have not found that much was gained by manipular attempts to realize the world of thought. Many eager persons successively make an experiment in this way and make themselves ridiculous. They acquire democratic manners, they foam at the mouth, they hate and deny. Worse, I observe that in the history of mankind there is never a solitary example of success taking their own tests of success. I say this polemically, or in reply to the inquiry, why not realize your world? But far be from me the despair which prejudges the law by a paltry empiricism, since there never was a right endeavor, but it succeeded. Patience and patience, we shall win at the last. We must be very suspicious of the deceptions of the element of time. It takes a good deal of time to eat or to sleep or to earn a hundred dollars and a very little time to entertain a hope and an insight which becomes the light of our life. We dress our garden, eat our dinners, discuss the household with our wives, and these things make no impression, are forgotten next week, but, in the solitude to which every man is always returning, he has a sanity in revelations which in his passage into new worlds he will carry with him. Never mind the ridicule, never mind the defeat, up again, old heart, it seems to say, there is victory yet for all justice, and the true romance which the world exists to realize will be the transformation of genius into practical power. Thank you for watching. If you are returning to the Classic Masterworks channel, welcome back. If you are new, please don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you will be made aware of our latest content.